not the risks outweigh the benefits. That's a personal decision for each and every one of us. I remember about a decade ago, I had a discussion with a pediatrician about whooping cough, also known as pertussis. We were discussing whether the risks of the vaccine outweighed the benefits. He clearly believed that there were very few risks and enormous benefits from that vaccine. There are several current vaccines for pertussis, depending upon the manufacturer, but they're generically referred to as the DTaP, which stands for diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis. And this vaccine is given to children. The TDAP, which is combined tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, is generally given to adolescents and adults. On the screen are the ingredients for the three most common DTaP vaccines. Let me give you the informed consent talk about the pertussis. So, whether or not you got it while you were pregnant, which if it was my wife, I wouldn't. I just don't, there are no safety studies of injecting aluminum into pregnant moms. So, but whether or not you got it during pregnancy, we have a handful of deaths a year in the United States from pertussis, whooping cough. And any death, if it's your baby, that's bad, right? So the way pediatricians think and infectious disease experts, and, and a lot of times it's the infectious disease experts who end up at the CDC and make all these recommendations. And I mean, they are the most well-read on infectious disease, right? And they also see the worst case scenario. So if you talk to any pediatrician or infectious disease person, we've probably treated or known about a child who was on a respirator fighting for their lives for whooping cough. And so that's why you'll hear pediatricians are just, you know, adamant, you've got to do, do this vaccine. And it might, probably would, reduce your risk to getting whooping cough. The current Tdap that we have, the acellular pertussis vaccine, is not very effective. In fact, it's so ineffective that they're now, the CDC now recommends for pregnancy, you get it every pregnancy. So if you just had a baby and you've just delivered and you get pregnant again, it's only been a year, they're gonna want you to do it again. Why? Well, it's not giving very good protection. So if we give you another one, maybe it'll give you some protection for that baby. So how many deaths are there a year in the United States from whooping cough? You want me to take a guess? Do you know? Um, less than 10. You're right. It's usually five to 10. Okay. So most people would probably think millions because of all the fear, right? There's five to 10 deaths. Most of them are in infants. In fact, most of them are three months and under. So if you're gonna get any protection, maybe you should give it during pregnancy. That's their rationale, right? Because those few deaths are happening in the first few months of life. That's the rationale, but they're not looking at the toxin side. So if you're giving informed consent, people need to know, do I wanna poison my baby, guaranteed poisoning, for the possible chance I'm gonna, how many births do we have in the US per, per year? Four million? Perfect, like four that. million. So we have about four million births, and let's just say we have four or five deaths per year. So it's a one in a million risk of you losing your baby to pertussis. It's literally one in a million. It's literally one in a million. If it's my baby, I'm willing to take that risk. If, in other words, not do that vaccine and take that one in a million chance. Much more likely to be struck by lightning probably twice or in the same spot, I don't know. Um, that's not to underestimate the, the tragedy for that person who loses their baby. But if you're, if you're doing scientific research, you need to look at data, right? So you've got a guaranteed risk of toxicity because you're injecting aluminum to a very small body. Children under three months of age are at higher risk of contracting pertussis and having it be a serious illness because their windpipe is so small and they really can't cough. And they, that can be a real problem. But the older that people get, the, the less likely they are to contract with anything serious. I mean, what is pertussis? It's a cough that's persistent, that doesn't have a fever, and is worse at night, and can go on for an extended period of time. It can happen in any age group. And now that we, don't, that we know for sure, I mean, the CDC even says, the pertussis vaccines really don't work much anymore. We don't really know why. We don't know if the bacteria has morphed or changed. We know we're seeing more of a, of a bacterial infection called parapertussis, which the vaccine doesn't do anything for that. And so, and when they have these outbreaks of pertussis that they're diagnosed, and then they retrospectively do the analysis, they find out that 80 some percent or more of the people who contract pertussis have been fully vaccinated. 
And so the numbers of unvaccinated are extraordinarily small, but of course, they're the ones that we blame for all of these outbreaks. You and I are being told that it's the unvaccinated children that are causing the spread of pertussis and that everyone needs to be vaccinated to protect those that can't be vaccinated against pertussis, okay? Like the immune compromised, okay? But the reality is, is that there's at least three dozen studies, and I document these and summarize these studies in my books, okay? That, that confirm that the pertussis vaccine actually caused evolutionary adaptation of the Bordetella pertussis microorganism, okay? So that it has adapted and evolved so that the strains that were targeted are no longer the strains that are causing the disease. They've become new strains and the vaccine is no longer effective against the new strains. Studies have just come out that confirm that people that are vaccinated against measles can spread the disease. They are carriers of the disease and they can spread it to other people. And they are. And this is the same thing that's happening with the pertussis vaccine. They have now documented that people that are vaccinated against pertussis are silent carriers of pertussis. It is the disease is developing inside their throats. Now, the person that got vaccinated may not develop the disease, but they are infectious. And like typhoid Mary from years ago, who did not exhibit symptoms of typhoid, but typhoid Mary was able to spread typhoid to other people. She was contagious. The people that are vaccinated against pertussis are like typhoid Mary. I call them whooping Wally and pertussis Peggy. Mm -hmm. They are silent carriers of pertussis and they are capable of spreading pertussis to other people. This is documented in the studies. What Neil Miller just said about people being silent carriers is supported by a November 25th, 2013 article in the Washington Post, which quotes FDA researcher Todd Merkel. He says, the research suggests that while the vaccine may keep people from getting sick, it doesn't prevent them from spreading whooping cough, also known as pertussis, to others. It could explain the increase in pertussis that we're seeing in the United States. In other words, the vaccines may keep you from showing any symptoms while you spread pertussis to everyone else. It's interesting that the Sanofi Pasteur version of the DTaP vaccine, Tripedia, listed SIDS, autism, and anaphylactic shock as possible adverse events. But this vaccine was pulled from the market in 2011 due to these adverse events. No person ever experiences two diseases at the same time. So if you're giving the diphtheria pertussis tetanus vaccine, you're giving three diseases into the body at the same time. I think it's interesting to note that back in the 1990s, all that Dr. Andrew Wakefield wanted to do was to investigate whether it would be safer for children to spread out the mumps and the measles vaccines. In his report, he stated that there may be an association between MMR and gastrointestinal disease. His research led him to write a 250-page report concluding that he could not support the use of the combined 3-in-1 MMR vaccine because it simply was not proven to be safe. Did you know that Dr. Andrew Wakefield's research has been replicated in at least 28 different studies in many different countries, including Switzerland? You mentioned um, a, a, a Swiss study um, 180 Swiss physicians analyzed 320 scientific works from around the world. They concluded there is no medical foundation for combining measles, mumps, rubella into no. one shot. And of course, this is what Andy Wakefield speaks about. Andy Wakefield says, he said, there might be some evidence that combining the vaccines is more more potentially more detrimental than not combining the vaccines. That's essentially what he said. He said, I... Andy Wakefield said, I still recommend vaccination. I just recommend that you break it up. Here's right. support for what Andy Wakefield said. These are 300, over 300 medical scientists from Europe that signed a petition that said 
there is no good reason to combine these vaccines. In fact, you have to make them individually. So, they so it can, takes extra work to combine it. Yeah, when Andy Wakefield made that recommendation, within six months, they took out that, they took away that option. The single vaccines were available hmm. when Andy Wakefield made that, made that claim. That was the, one of the original hypotheses with that 1998 study of the uh, 12 authors in Britain on the potential link between autism and, and inflammatory bowel disease. Between MMR. I'm sorry, MMR and yeah. inflammatory bowel disease that had autism as a, a component. Right, and all that study did was make a suggestion yeah. as to whether giving the measles, mumps vaccine together led to an increase in incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, knowing what the live infection close together looked like. And all that study did was suggest that maybe it's more prudent to give the measles vaccine and the mumps vaccine separately. They had said in the conclusion it deserves further study. They hadn't said that they had proved that MMR vaccine causes autism or inflammatory bowel disease. No. They just simply said that there was a, a, an association that they noted. Right. But what happened at the press conference was they were asked the question, I think Dr. Wakefield was asked the question, well, what should parents do? And when he said, well, they should ask for separate vaccines, that caused an uproar because, well, first of all, you know, you can't get separate MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine anymore. You can't get separate the theory of pertussis, tetan uh, pertussis tetanus vaccine anymore. You can get DT, but, you know, now they want to have combination vaccines and their market for combination vaccines was threatened by the idea right. that, that parents could choose to have separate vaccines. So there's something that has happened in our culture that has now demonized people for wanting to just take care of their family the way they see fit. Mm -hmm. And informed consent has always been part of making any kind of medical decision. And now we don't, there's no informed consent if your rights are being taken away on right. whether you can make that choice or not. We all need to stand up for freedom of choice in medical interventions, like vaccines. If we don't have that right, then what rights do we really have left? It's very hard when somebody questions your long-standing beliefs that you've never thought to question. It's like turning your world upside down. And yeah. the thing is, is that we've got to turn the world upside down to get it back spinning on its axis because the problem is our children are suffering and children's health in the United States is terrible. What is going on? And unfortunately, part of it is because we have too many vaccines too soon. An aggressive vaccine schedule that isn't based on science doesn't help our children. It certainly helps line the pockets of the pharmaceutical industry. And unfortunately, it helps also make doctors make a living. You know, vaccines are the bread and butter of pediatrics. Um, but it's not helping our children's health. And that's the problem. I've interviewed a lot of doctors and many of them will only speak to me off the record. But what they say is they say, I was one of the people who said my way or the highway, you either do things the way that I say or you get out. And they say, I trusted the CDC. I trusted the American Academy of Pediatrics. I didn't bother to go and read the literature myself. And so I thought parents who came in with questions were just plain wrong. Those doctors also had the best interests of their patients in mind. They're kicking parents out of their practice because they're afraid that those patients, those kids won't be healthy if they stay in their practice, right? The best doctors wake up and they realize the CDC is wrong and the AAP is wrong and we've got to change our schedules. Number one thing, it saved my career, is I had parents come to me and say, Dr. Thomas, have you looked at this article? Have you read about this? Have you thought about that? And physicians who know it all, right, are not interested. So you're probably not gonna get through to some physicians who just aren't open to getting any advice or knowledge from somebody who's not a doctor. But I am so grateful to the various patients who came to me